Hello, I'm Ron Miscavige, and this is Life After Scientology. Welcome to the show, and we have a special guest back on again, which you're going to enjoy very much because we have some very pertinent subjects to bring up about the abuses of the Church of Scientology. But before we get into that, I would like to thank uh, a Patreon, Italian Vapor, who went from $5 to $8. So uh, thank you very much, Italian Vapor. What should I say? Costa Dich. Okay, well, maybe you can write to me and tell me what that means. I know how to say it. I'm not sure what it means, though. <clears throat> anyway, uh, for those of you who are new to this, what the Patreon is, it's a way for you to contribute to this show. And if you go to my site, therealronmiscavige.com, you can see how you could do this. And uh, it, your donations are very much appreciated. It'll turn you immediately from a spectator into a participant and help the ongoingness of this show to continue on to do what we're doing, which is enlightening and educating people as to the abuses of cults. And specifically, these days, we're talking about the Church of Scientology. I will get into other cults as time goes on, but we still have some very important interviews to take place, and this is one of them. So, without any more words, good morning, Karen. Hey, Ron. Hello. That's Karen de la Courier on the other screen. Uh, you can tell us her because she's not wearing a black blazer. I am. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's get started. And, you know, what I want to, I'd like to take this up. Karen, how long have you been with the Church of Scientology? I was in 45 years. Okay. I was in 42 years. Mm. That's a total of 87 years between the two of us. Mm. That's a lot of knowingness and a lot of walking the walk. In other words, Karen and I didn't hear about this or hear about it from another person. We actually participated in the entire structure and uh, the policy and the technology of Scientology for a total of 87 years. And now you might say, if you were a listener, if you were in that long, how come you didn't leave sooner? Karen, you want to take this up? Yeah, yeah. Ron, it just shows how powerful belief is. Belief is a powerful thing. I'm going to di divert and just make a little point here. Do you remember that incredible story of int bass musical chairs? Oh, you were cool. right there at the bass, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, your son, David Miscavige, put on the music. You're the music man. Um, what, what was the music he was playing? Freddie Mercury's. For, yeah, uh, Karen, before we go any further, I'm getting little pops off your microphone. Oh. Is there any way you could just lower that away from your lips? Yes, yes. That would help. Is that better? Yeah, that's immediately better. Uh, sorry, oh. for, but no, you know, no. it's going to help the whole interview. Yeah. yeah, it's the Freddie Mercury thing. and. Uh, no, it's a very famous, what was it, the, the music in musical chairs? Anyway, your son was playing this had this boom box and the sound playing. And at two in the morning, people were running around trying to grab chairs because the threat was only the last person who grabbed the chair could stay on the base. And there was fist fights and the broken chairs and there was just a melee uh, and people, they were fighting to stay in yeah. that hell i'm making the point of what lawrence wright called the prison of belief because yeah. you are you know why did we stay over 40 years we believed we believed in the cause or we believed in a better future or we believed laughingly that we were helping the planet yeah but 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 what struck me the most in that macabre incident of musical chairs was the fact that people were fighting tooth and nail to not leave the base when it would have been liberation and yeah. escape. That's how powerful 
belief is. Uh, Karen, I'll tell you, I agree with you. Listen, why did I stay so long? I thought I was helping everybody on this planet. <laughs> I thought with the uh, widespread use of Scientology technology and policy, we would make a better place for everybody to live. And it would help every man, woman, and child. And uh, I thoroughly believe this. And I'll tell you, the people around me who had been in for extensive periods of time felt the same way. Just as you were pointing out, that belief is is a powerful thing. But behind it, though, was the, the, and the more powerful thing, not to say that you're incorrect on what you said, the more powerful thing is that you were helping. And that's a big deal because people have this inborn instinct, except for, let's say, the psychopaths, the two and a half, three percenters, they want to help another person. I mean, you can see it in every day in life. I'll give you an example. I live in the Milwaukee area, and I had to go down to, uh, to pay a parking ticket down at the police station downtown. Now, I had a lot of change, but very few quarters to put into the uh, eat the, the meter, the parking meter. Mm -hmm. And these people were coming by and I said, excuse me. And I held out some money, some dollar bills. And I said, could, could you sell me some quarters? This woman pilled out a whole bunch of quarters, put it in my hand and pushed the dollar bills aside. She just wanted to help me just so I could not have to pay a ticket. And that that's yeah. maybe a small example, but man, I'll tell you, to help people, you know, with clothes or charity, with food. It's a big deal. It's a big deal here. And I'm sure it's that way everywhere. Yes. The illusion is, this is helping. And the, the, this is so much greater than you. Never mind your inconvenience. This is yeah. a huge worldwide saving. <laughs> oh, we swallowed it all. We really did swallow it all. Well, you've got to give Villaron Hubbard credit for one thing. He was the greatest con man who ever lived. Yet, I, I do think he had some workable things thrown in there that were the basic hooks that got people started on it, gaining confidence in what everything he said was true. And that's how it worked. Well, what do you think, Karen? Well, uh, I think that part of it Ron wasn't look you and I were not stupid we weren't born on a banana boat right we were not that we saw things that we shook our head in disbelief but one of the main beliefs in Scientology and and, and I still believe this is that you are an immortal being that you live lifetime after lifetime after lifetime. It's an old Eastern precept, reincarnation, right? Right. You're just in this body. And then, so the mindset when you're in is, so what if this life is bad and a piece of hell? You're, <laughs> this is a blink of an eye. You're an infinite being. You're going to live millions and <laughs> billions of lives in the future. And you've lived millions and billions and trillions of lives in the past. So if this life is a little rough for a period of time, so what is do, do you agree yeah. that you kind oh, yeah. of and that, that, that is and, look, let me say this for the viewers who disagree with this. It's totally <laughs> okay if you disagree because yeah. this is a personal thing. You either yeah. hold that to be true or it's not true for you. And if it isn't, well then yeah. nobody pounding on your head is gonna make you believe that. But right. that is a powerful uh, pull and draw that keeps us going. And that is big deal. Okay, so I have it a bit rough right now, but look, look yeah. at all the good I'm doing and I'll live more lives and they're going to be more pleasant than this one. And what yeah. Scientology sells you on is give us your money and we'll make your futures better. Yeah. Remember, you're not going to live just this lifetime. Don't you want to come back prosperous and healthy and wealthy and in the right family? We, we will make your future better. But in reality, your future, certainly your immediate future, is strangled and goes down, 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 down. And that's why Scientology is hemorrhaging 
with members departing. Oh, Ron, I can't tell you how many people write to me under the radar. Yeah. They don't want to make waves, but they've departed the mindset. I believe you because with, I'll tell you, with the advent of the internet, the toothpaste is out of the tube. You can't pull that back in. You can't, you know, unknow what you've read and yes. see to be truth because the truth of it is, you know, unless you're, well, I, I don't know who would go on and go into an organization now. The very, very, very gullible or those uninformed people. And to be uninformed these days with the internet, it's, it's pretty tough for me to believe. Well, okay, but now, look, you stayed connected to the church even after you got out of the Sea Organization, right? I left the Sea Organization in 1990. Right, but you stayed around for how much longer? Uh, another 20 years. I departed all of Scientology in 2010. Okay, why did you stay the other 20 years? That's my question to you. Well, actually, five of those years, I completely withdrew from, so there's 15 years that I stayed in. My son was in the Sea Organization. I got Alexander it. Jinch. You know, they really, one, I, I really protest another lie of the cult that they tweeted only a week ago that they obey all the child labor laws. This is a completely fraudulent claim. Uh, Alexander Jench, my son, was put to slave labor, vacuuming carpets, cleaning toilets, making the Fort Harrison lobby look good at 11 years old and mm. was not going to school. In those primitive days, we had <laughs> we had something called calling cards. Alexander couldn't keep calling me. He didn't. The people didn't have cell phones, so he would use a calling card, and he would be on the phone three to five times a day to me from the Fort Harrison, explaining to me his job. This is an eleven-year-old having wow. to clean toilets, and you know, Ron, what really, really just got me. I, I was sent to the RPI by a very famous int finance ethics officer, Don Larson. <laughs> and before I was sent to the running program, that nightmare, run, run around the pole, right. I had to clean the Fort Harrison, the initial RPF. And do you know, is a bizarre, strange fluke, my son, had to clean <laughs> the exact same, we used to discuss this, the exact same, the banister, you go around the corner, the toilet. He, so I produced a child who had to do the same slave manual labor on the same geographical spots that I had to do 20 years earlier. You can imagine how no, 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 seething no, no. I felt that my own son now was doing the same job I did. Mm -hmm. That's unbelievable. That is unbelievable. I tell you what's more unbelievable that at 11 years old, he's doing an adult job, getting no schooling. And what was he getting paid in those days? Do you know? Oh, the pay was nothing. But it's worse than that, Ron. And I'm going to say it in this broadcast. At 12 years old, he was having sexual intercourse with a 40 year old called Marie Marie at mm -hmm. the quality Inn down the road from the Fort Harrison. Now, I didn't know this and they certainly didn't report it to Clearwater PD. Sexual intercourse, molestations, rapes occur repeatedly in the Church of Scientology, repeatedly, oh. but they're covered up. The Catholic Church does not have some copyright on this kind of conduct. Wow. It is flagrant in the Church of Scientology. And this was already briefed on national TV on a show called 2020 by a youngster called Serge Gill. Serge Gill is only one 
of several people that have uh, there's a Facebook group for second generation where they've all shared a lot of stories on this so Alexander Gench was having sexual intercourse never reported always covered up and what they do in in, in the cult is they in, when they find out they quickly get the people out of jurisdiction so that if it leaked to the police nothing more will be found out wow and the reason that i knew about it as soon as my departure was announced that i was gone matt pesh wrote to me you know matt pesh of course i do i've had him on the program yeah oh yeah well oh. matt was treasury sec and he was told the son of the president of the Church of Scientology International has to get an airfare to go into, to get out of town immediately. He and Marie Warren need to go immediately to LA. And he had to come up with the finance for the airfare. And oh, and it was explained he's, they've had sex. And so he was one of five different people that corrupt oh tom devok was cocmo int you know tom devok of course i do he, yeah he corroborated because main e executives were in and that's how i found out uh so i'm oh, saying on if, on youtube on tv my son had sexual intercourse at 12 years old and it was never reported to clearwater pd and it's covered up by the church, as if it never happened. Total cover up. Mm -hmm. Well, this is their operation. Now, you know, let's not be surprised by this, Karen, because. Not it, only that, he was policy. put in lockdown. Mm -hmm. Alexander was put in complete lockdown, that he was never. So he was told and warned and threatened that he was never to speak about that. You wow. know how the cult. Uh, has huge volumes and volumes of technology on give it all up confess yeah. don't don't keep it back don't withhold don't keep secrets you'll only feel better when you talk about it well when it's dirty and when it can affect the good public relations of the cult the enforcement is withhold keep yeah. it secret yep that is exactly what it is and i'll tell you you could say that prior to that you're giving it up is giving them blackmail yeah. uh information yeah. because there's no such thing as a priest -pen penitent relationship in a church of scientology anything you say will be used against you in either like uh, character assassination, hate videos like they have on me, like they have on you. Yeah. They accuse you of think, doing things that are unspeakable, yet they say it with a straight face and because they're a church, we're supposed to believe them. They are no more a church than the United Mine Workers in Pennsylvania are. <laughs> As a matter of fact, probably the United Mine Workers are closer to a church because they probably go to the churches in the town they're in on Sunday and have the semblance of an actual religion which include a deity which there is none in scientology uh you are made to think that you and all of your friends created this universe and you know i mean you can tell people whatever you want to but sometimes it goes a little over the edge this is a big bait and switch in scientology yeah, they will I, I not tell you there is no god there is no god in scientology there is no, no worship there is no saying there was a greater creator, an author. You, the they will be evasive when you say, well, what about God? No, 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 no. That's confident. <laughs> yeah. When you reach higher levels, you will. Well, the higher levels is simply you are God. And yeah. you created it all. And you are the God. Why does Scientology hide that so much? I think they don't want to offend Christians and they don't want to offend people of the Jewish faith and all kinds of other people that wander in. 
there is no God in Scientology. Yeah, I'm sure that's the way, that's the reason they do it. They want to be politically correct, as they say these days, and, uh, you know, tell a short story that we're the religion of religions. It's, it's such bullshit. It's just hard for me to even keep on going over it because they say things that defy common sense. Look, I won't even get into it. Let, let's just, because when you get to the highest level, they start telling you that Jesus Christ was a, a lover of young men and boys and uh, he wasn't that good of a guy after all. And then also when you get to that level, they say, okay, now you're, you're back at the beginning of the bridge. You're no more than you, you were when you started with us. <laughs> Cause over matter, energy, space, and time. That puts you in a causative position. All I can say is you look back and maybe you spent between two and $400,000 and you could say, hmm, I wonder if that was worth it. I can tell you right now, it isn't. I, I don't care how much money you have to drop a couple of hundred thousand dollars on a lie at the very end. It's not a very rewarding feeling. But anyway, that's my opinion. And I think it's a lot of people's opinion who have done it and have left because there are a lot of people who achieved OT8 who have left the church. You know that, Karen? Yes. Oh, yes. An exodus after. Yeah. Absolutely. And if they didn't leave the church, they got cancer. They died off of heart attacks, strokes. Uh, they got diabetes. So they didn't become more healthy. And they didn't become vibrant, supernatural human beings. But no. a lot of OT8 is just made up stuff. Um, I, I, there's five different versions of it. OT8 is the very highest spiritual level. No, no, wait a minute. I did attain. not know there's five different versions. There's I five heard there were two. No, no, no. Five no. OT8s got together, put their heads together. They did it in different time, you know, late 80s, early 90s. And there are five different versions of it. Could you so, expand on that? Well, uh, a little bit anyway. Yeah. The, the first OT8, where people had to read that Jesus Christ was a pedophile and that Hubbard claimed and wrote he was satanic or the evil one, or I forget the language used. That created a horrible, horrible backlash. And every single one of those had to be recalled. Some wouldn't even go back to the ship. And then there was version two. Ray Midoff, as senior CS international, was always supposed to come up with the they went through Hubbard's own folders, picked out this and this and this, and tried to make that the OT level. That that that's how these new newfangled things come yeah. into existence. This was a compilation of a little this and that from Hubbard's own folders. You know the main content of OT8. D didn't I tell you that? Yours BT cluster? Did uh, I tell you you didn't bring it up on any show, but go ahead. I, I thought I may have covered it in the last interview with you, but basically all that you've ever told Scientology is recorded, not only on video, but the auditor is handwriting very fast what you say. So for the highest level in Scientology, workers go through every single page of everything you've ever said. And they find identities that you've named throughout your confessional auditing. And because Scientology practice takes you into past lives by different commands, like in Dianetics, there's likely to be these identities um, Roman soldier, uh, nun, uh, a nun, a holy nun, uh, a mischievous 
child that fell out of an apple tree. Whatever, they want. all of these are compiled. And the main concept of OT8 is to, the end result is supposed to be truth revealed. They claim you're going to have truth revealed. So all these identities are called off while you're, hand, while you're holding the aluminum cans. And if the e-meter reads on any of those, the counselor asks you, was that really you? Was it an attached spirit that you have called BT, body thetan? Or was it, was this identity a, gr <laughs> a group of body thetans called cluster, a group? Right. So, so this Roman soldier was was that lifetime really yours? Was it an attached spirit that subsequently joined you, or whatever? Or was it a gang of a gang of spirits, a whole cluster? <laughs> then, whatever reads is then procedurally handled. If it was a body thetan, then the procedure is to have that spirit exorcised from your body and if it was a gang of them that they also have to be diffused there's also subsequent questions where it's asked this identity was it a true identity or was it false true or false are key questions and then at the end of ot8 the counselor tells you everything you've been running and auditing was not really you. It was all other spirits attached to you. And this is, a, in other words, you've got other beings and they were quacking. And all that half a million dollars you gave us, that was... <laughs> That was for the quacking of these attached spirits. Well, and that causes a person to be pretty caved in. Mm -hmm. I'll bet it does. As a matter of fact, I just kind of slightly said uh, that what, that's what it was, that at the end you, it wasn't you, but... That's a very comprehensive explanation. You went into it a little bit, I think, on our prior program, but that's as comprehensive as I've ever heard, which is real good because that is the knee plus ultra. That's the top of the bridge, right? That is the highest level. There, and it there's no place to go from there. There's no up half there. a million dollars to get there, sometimes a million dollars, to get to that level that I've already explained to you what it is. Yep, and, and, and you know, Ron, this is funny. The fanfare, the excitement, and the lead up to this is unbelievable. Yeah. You get all these security checks to ask, are you going to go, are you going to ever reveal these secrets? Are you going to share it with your husband? Are you going to ever be less than trustworthy? You get dozens of questions at $25,000 or so to be eligible for this. And the night before you start this OT8, you get an invitation put under your door on free ones. And the invitation is a archival paper, thick like a wedding invitation with gold symbol. You are invited to the level of OT8. And this is like a People open this, this incredible in, invite. Can you see how the hype is built? <laughs> you, yeah. you are one of these few, few point zero 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 one percent of people, privileged elite people on planet Earth that are actually going to get the secrets of the universe which I've already told you, that's what truth revealed is. Mm -hmm. 
And the people who hear this don't have to spend even 20 cents, nor a quarter of a million or a half million dollars. There you have it. So any of you who are in Scientology, who are under the radar, that's what you're heading for. And I'll give you a little bit of advice. Just step out of there. Just start your own life. Just start your own life. And if they want people to disconnect from you, so be it. But I'll tell you this. It's better than going down that path and coming to what we just told you about just now. Now, this leads us into another little subject, which I really want to get into, because if you were to do something like reveal any of these things to anybody, you'd be considered to be a suppressive person. Where well, there's many ways to become a suppressive person, and all of them are very easy these days. And almost nobody who is declared an SP, short for suppressive person, qualifies under all of the points that L. Ron Hubbard wrote in a technical bulletin. Actually, it was a, a PAB, Professional Auditor's Bulletin, I think 13, called The Abrative Personality. And it's also in a book written by Martha Stout called, I think it's a psychopath yes. next door. Or a sociopath next door, one or the other. They give all these points. But it is far easier to be declared. Like, if you were just to have thoughts, bad thoughts about maybe David Miscavige or the church or L. Ron Hubbard and this come up in a sec check and you refuse to change your mind, at that point, forget everything. You're an SP. Now, along with that comes disconnection. And by the way, I want to go into just a little bit, but I want you to be first on what I call the ideal mind. Oh. But let's get into this because if you were to do something like talk out against the church, declare an SP, you could be the subject of fair game. Do you want to expand on that, Karen? Well, fair game is simply revenge, right? Fair game is in the English language in Webster's Dictionary. But Hubbard, Hubbard did have this vengeful streak where if you harmed his alter ego, which was Scientology, if you were critical, if you did a pushback, then you were treading thin ice. And the next step is an actual declaration labeled you suppressive person. Once you were suppressive person, as named by the cult, all bets are off. They could harm you. They could destroy your business. They could take away the, your children if they were already in the cult. They could absolutely lie, cheat, steal. Uh, I'll tell you a little small story. I lent somebody $5,000. <laughs> Good friend. And then, remember I told you I left the church and I came out. I went back to this person and said, I want my $5,000. And he said, F off. You're a declared suppressive person. And the ethics officer told me, I don't have to deal with you. The ethics. <laughs> so I called up his dad because I thought, you know, his dad would want his son to be honorable. I didn't donate that $5,000. So I called the father and he was even worse. Get off the phone, you effing SP. You're a suppressive person. You're not. Don't you ever call me again. You will not get one dime back because you're suppressive. So, <laughs> so I dropped it. So if so, the lie, cheat, steal is what Hubbard said to do if you're declared a suppressive person. They were following Hubbard. Yep. They stole the five thousand dollars. And that makes him an ethical person in his eyes when he looks in the mirror and he thinks, gee, uh, I turned down an SP. I did a good deed today. <laughs> that is, as far as I'm concerned, one of the attributes of what I call the ideal mind. Oh. What is the ideal mind? I'll, I'll give you some of the attributes and then you can contribute to this 
or even the audience, if you want to write in and give us some points that you think would help to understand this. Here's one of the points of an ideal mind. To be able to, if you were told by the ethics officer that you had a disconnect from your family, to do so, whether it be your mother or father or both of them, or maybe sisters or brothers, to disconnect them from them and not feel any remorse, but actually feel good that you contribute to the greater good of the Church of Scientology by getting these people off your lines. That would be one of the attributes you could say is part of the ideal mind. Here's another one. <clears throat> if you were a Scientology employer and you found out that one of your people was now declared an SP, when they came into work that day, you could say, you're fired, give them no notice, send them out on the street, feel no remorse. Just do, do things, do that, feel no remorse at all. As a matter of fact, you feel good because you obeyed the ethics officer and you're a good Scientologist. That's another attribute of uh, the ideal mind. Karen, if you want to contribute to this, go ahead, because you see where I'm heading with this. This is part and parcel of the church to after years and years or maybe days or weeks or months of indoctrination. Once you get this person's mind, you can mold it into anything you'd like it to be. And as far as I'm concerned, they want everybody to have just as the church as a third dynamic activity has ideal orgs as you as a first dynamic activity, you should have an ideal mind. It goes against the very laws of nature. I know it does. Sever the connection between father and son, father and daughter, daughter to father. Yeah. The, you know, there's this wonderful friend I have, Lori Hodgson, and she, her story, there are a lot of tears in this area of disconnection. Siblings are ordered to disconnect from each other. Lori went to Austin, Texas, or some Houston, Texas, whatever, in to just see her son. And she she was just told by her son, get away from me. Lori left the church. And you know what? They tweeted, there's a tweet, like five days ago. There is no such thing as disconnection in the church. I don't know how they can say this. But one of the things that costs the cult of Scientology the most problem, if you could do a hierarchy of what are their problems, what's wrong with this cult, if you could do one, two, three, four, five, I think number one that harms them more than anything else, number two would be the extortion of huge money, just never ending, never ending runaway money extortion. But number one, because it's painful to lose someone you love or to be severed off connection from your own bloodline. Yeah. And, and the cult cannot, they just enforce this. It's against natural law. The whole point of having a family is that you have that trust and bond and just tightness of support yep. and Scientology doctrines want to take a hammer and slice that line, cut that cord, cut that line. And they do it every day of the week, every hour of the day yeah. in some continent, some parents have lost their kids or the kids have lost their parents or siblings have lost their other sibling. This yeah. is in the woof and warp. This is this is an intricate part of Scientology disconnection. And it to me, it's the most despicable thing you could do to anybody. I mean, it, there's there's literally no excuse for. Well, it. look at you, Ron. You're getting on in years, oh, and yeah. I know one of your dreads is that you'll never. I know you dread that you can't reconnect with your own grandchildren and you don't even know how many great-grandchildren 
No, have, I don't. No, I don't. And I'll tell you, the church doesn't care. They do it just because all of the higher ups have the ideal mind. Yeah. And the ideal mind tells me if he is declared a suppressive person, L. Ron Hubbard says, disconnect him. And that's what they do. And they do it with impunity, with not one ounce of care. Yes. So, uh, you know, I don't want to take this because you want, you want Karen. No, no. Early on, I was telling you of belief and how once you believe and you're in the tunnel, yeah. you lose all rational thought, all critical thought. Once you believe and you're hooked, now there's no question that some techniques can give you benefit. In those lower levels, people have extraordinary experiences sometimes. They, they just feel a sense of wellness after therapy, the Scientology therapy sessions. Yeah. And there's the hook. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, a person seems to be willing to go through an awful lot of pain and suffering for that little bit of high. Yeah. Right. Look at look at what drug addicts do. Look at how drug drug addicts keep. T they'll even though the the coming down, the crash and burn after an LSD trip. I've never taken LSD, but I've <laughs> case supervised thousands and thousands of cases. And I know the downside of the withdrawal after a drug. But does that stop someone taking the drug for that little, for that, yeah. for that high? And, and I do feel that once you let the cult grab hold of your neck and give you a win, yeah. you, you're hooked. You're hooked. And then you're on your way to develop the ideal mind. But I'm, I'm going to interject something here that may seem off the wall, but I'm going to say it anyway, because I've experienced this my whole life. I can tell you how to get a high that doesn't cost you anything except a little time. And that is exercise. Yes. Take a vigorous exercise workout for maybe 10 or 15 minutes, and the body will release endorphins. And these are as powerful as a drug with no side effect no harmful effect except you feel great yes. and it's probably something that people who don't exercise have no idea what the hell i'm talking about yet those of you who do work out i'll bet you've experienced exactly what i just said and that's part of why people who start to exercise on a regular basis will continue to do so because they get a high after the workout yes. anyway that's my two cents and you know uh that's good practical advice. It Absolutely. is. And I'll tell you, i got Very a friend. Good. His name is uh, John Peterson. He's a fitness guru. And he has all kinds of books for sale on his uh, website. And he sells an isometric workout kit. Not high priced. And it's an easy way to get a workout, whether you want to use equipment or use what the, he calls the isometric workout kit. And I, I recommend it. And by the way, he ain't paying me to do this. This is something I'm doing <laughs> on my own because... I've, I've used this stuff and it works great. And I get high that way, just not a long time, but you feel great after the, the workout. That could be part of your getting over this bullshit that you went through with the church. Number one, walk out the door. Don't listen to them anymore. And if they come after you, call the cops. Sometimes you got to do something drastic to get away. Listen, my wife and I planned our escape for six months to get away from the church with as much of the little things that we had, the books that I had, or I had a, uh, a buffer for a car and little things, personal clothes in order for us to get out of there with something. Literally we planned it for six months before we finally on one Sunday morning, March 25th, 2012, went to one of the gates at the compound nine o'clock in the morning, pressed the button, the guard didn't say anything, opened up the gate, and we were on our way. And if I hadn't done that, and also I should point this out, and if I didn't have a music manager by the name of Adam Ravini, who flunked every, every melody that I ever wrote, just on a regular basis, I lived days, 
weeks, months, working day and night, doing melodies, flunked all of them, would denigrate me. If it wouldn't have been for that, where I wasn't, I didn't feel I was earning my own keep, I might still be there. Wow. So in a way, I got to thank him. <laughs> he made it so fucking miserable to me. I, I said, I got to get out of here. Because if anything, I'm not, I'm not a deadbeat. I was raised in a coal mining area of Pennsylvania. Tough area, but when you were a kid and you heard this all the time, if you don't work, you don't eat. I mean, don't get me wrong. They would not feed you. But as a kid, you did your chores because you felt you had to contribute to this work your dad was doing to support everybody. So you learn how not to be a deadbeat. In other words, somebody who doesn't pay their goddamn bills. I diverged for a minute, but I'm glad I did because I wanted to get that point out about exercise helping you. And yeah. you, you could get a high that way. You don't have to do drugs. You don't have to do anything special except exercise. Ron, that's good. That's very good free advice you gave. Ron, I want to get back to your escape, st <laughs> escape okay. stories are thrilling. You had to plan. Now, I don't know if the audience get it. You cannot just walk in and out of the cult of Scientology. No. If your staff, Sea Org, there are security guards and hundreds of cameras everywhere watching. And a security guard, if he felt you were fleeing, would tackle you to the ground and bring you back. Oh, Ron, I don't think we'd have time today, but I'd love to get into on a show with you the posses that were sent out for blow drill. This means people fled and then <laughs> a gang of a gang of Sea Org members went to retrieve them. But let's get back to your six months. Weren't you worried that you would be put on an e-meter police polygraph and asked and then withholds would read? If you were planning it, you had it in your head for months, no? Tell me more about that. Yes. Well, okay. First of all, my wife was going through what they called security checking for that entire six months. Wow. And she was successful in withholding that. Wow. Now, that would be called, and the church calls it this, a laudable withhold. Mm. You remember that term? Yes, absolutely. That yes. would be something that would be good if you withheld. Yes. So I don't know if I had exactly that in mind, but if it ever came close to that, I thought of something different other than what the auditor was saying to me. So that way, I, the little but, bit of the sex checking I had, it would just pass over. It never came up. But, but I'll tell you this. It was yeah. a constant worry as to whether Becky was going to be caught out on it. And we're talking about six months now. We're not talking about six days yeah. or six weeks. Yeah. That's a long time to keep on going in session uh, yeah. on a daily or uh, bi-weekly basis and withhold that. Yeah. But we had to do that because if we didn't, we'd be caught and I would still be there. I wouldn't be talking to you on the air right now. Yeah. And the other couple things that helped me in this, there were two things actually. The major one was this, that I was the chairman of the board's father. Yeah. And it was unthinkable that I would blow or escape. It just unthinkable. And uh, the other one was I was 76 years old and nobody thought you'd have the energy or the drive to get the hell out of there. Hey, listen, I'm 82 years old and I do these. I play music. I work out six days a week and I keep myself active. So age does have something to do with it. You don't live forever. But if you lay around like a goddamn bum watching Westerns on TV every afternoon, uh, you're going to have a different attitude toward life. I have an attitude where I feel I have a crusade. And I know when I left, I didn't feel I would do this. I thought I would just, and I used to say this when I would hear about Mike Rinder and they would tell us bad news, what he was doing or other people. Uh, I used to think to myself, why just, why don't they just get a job and get on with life? You can't do that. You just can't do that. You, you, if you think you can do that, you're dreaming. And it's a nice dream, but it's a dream, okay? Uh, when I got out, that's all I planned on doing. And as circumstances led to it, uh, they caught the private investigators who were following me yeah. about a year and three months after I left. Yeah. And uh, they were getting paid 10 Gs a week to follow me. And 
carrying guns in the trunk, a rifle with a silencer on it. Yeah. And then I found out that uh, they were following me to a supermarket one day and I was bringing stuff out to the car. Thought my cell phone was going to fall out of my pocket. The private investigators thought I was having a heart attack and uh, they called it in. A couple minutes later, a guy got on the phone, identified himself as David Miscavige and he said, listen, if it's his time to die, let him die. Don't intervene. Don't do anything. And if you want to hear this interview, you can go on my website, The Real Ron Miscavige, and listen to the police interview, and they'll tell you what I just mentioned. So <clears throat> at that point, I thought, I've lost my daughters. I've lost my grandchildren. I'll never see my great-grandchildren again. I'm going to do something about it. Wrote a book, ended up being the number one bestseller. That's it. Ruthless. May 6, 2016, came out. Number one bestseller on the nonfiction list. And I've been on 2020, a lot of shows. You all know this. Talking out. They wanted, I think they actually want enough people to do this to put their ethics in. Mm -hmm. Because it's beyond sanity that they would come after me and do these things and think I'm going to sit there like a little puppy dog and not do anything about it. Listen, I'm a Marine veteran. I don't walk around with my tail between my legs. So here I am. I'm talking about them on the air. Uh, and this is the result of their policy. This is the result of being run by people who have the ideal mind. This is what you produce. You produce a fucking enemy. And believe me, I'm going to keep doing this as long as I live. While we're talking about that, there's another thing I want to bring up before I end the show, and that's Patreon. If any of you would like to help out with the ongoingness of this show and have people like Karen, wonderful guest, and we're going to do another one, and I'll tell you why in a second. Uh, if you let want to me, help. Let me step in on this Patreon thing. Okay. When you leave the cult of Scientology, even though I believe... How long were you in the Sea Org? I was in the Sea Org 26 and a half years. All right. Almost 27 years he slaved those 80 hour weeks. There is no pension. There is no 401k. There is no retirement. There is no medical to take care of you should you have ups and downs. Nothing. He's 82 years old and he is beating the drum to give you revelations on our favorite cult. Just do a Patreon. You could give from $2 on up a month. You just fill in a little thing and contribute to this 82-year-old man who's trying to make, make it all happen. He does gigs endlessly. He plays music for bands. But to keep the show, rent the studio, put all the do or everything, just chip in. And so you can be a contributor not just a spectator of how Scientology is finally revealed and taken out. Thank you. Well, I want to thank you, Karen. I'm, I'm not looking for a handout as much as some help. So if you can do it, appreciate it very much. And Karen, I want to thank you very much for the show. I want to have you back again because there yes. are some other subjects that we haven't oh, entered upon. Yeah, we got so if I have your agreement to come back, sure. I, can, I can end the show. Otherwise, I'll be talking to you for another 10 minutes trying to talk <laughs> into it, all right? <laughs> okay, you. is Love it you. a deal? My pleasure. My pleasure. Mm -hmm. Okay, my producer is signaling me. I have one thing. Um, so Alice Lynch sent a $2 super chat that says, Thanks for all you uh, all you guys do. Dies deck, dies, dies deck. Karen and MM. Um, what was your term for grandfather again? Oh, jaw deck. Jaw deck. How did you spell it? I don't know, but I think your mic just cut out. <laughs> did your mic fall off? I don't know. Yeah, I think it did. Uh, follow the cord. I can hear you. There it is. There it is. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Yeah, so thank you, Alice, for the $2. There, how's that? Am I on now? That's perfect. You're okay. on. Okay. This is the smallest microphone <laughs> I've ever held in my hand. Anyway, the term is Jodek.
Yeah, that's Polish for grandfather. <clears throat> that's what I told my little uh, granddaughter Winnie to call me. And I said, now, what do you call me? Remember, it's Jadek. She says, Bubbles. So that's what my name is from Winnie. Bubbles. That's, I, I guess that's grandfather in her, great grandfather in her language. No, she's, that's your honorary grand. What's that? That's your honorary granddaughter. Oh, it's my honorary granddaughter. Yeah. Oh, <clears throat> well, good. I'm glad you called in. So it's Jadek. And it, just if you spell J A D E K, that's phonetically. I don't know how you'd spell it actually in Polish, but if you want to write in and call me Jadek, I'll know immediately who you are. So thank you very much for calling. So is that it? Okay, Sean, Karen. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Ron. Bye-bye. Okay, and uh, I'll see you the next time. Uh, from me, I'm Ron Miscavige. This is Life After Scientology. See you on the next episode. Bye-bye.